Our guest tonight found out whether there was any land north of the North American continent. He made that first discovery flight, and I must say that Admiral Byrd, our guest tonight, is not only our greatest living explorer, but he's been an inspiration to countless Americans. Admiral Byrd, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any yeah. unexplored land left on this Earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. And not up around the North Pole, because it's getting crowded up there now, because they find out it's really usable, not only to live in, but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that unexplored. That's a tremendous So job. there's a lot of adventure left mm -hmm. down at the bottom of the world. Hidden portal entrances, a city made of crystal, an underground civilization. What's really going on in Antarctica? Few stories are as riveting and shrouded in mystery as the narrative of Admiral Richard E. Byrd's secret journal, a tale that transports us to the heart of the hollow earth and the mythical civilization of Agartha. Admiral Richard E. Byrd, a decorated American naval officer, polar explorer, and aviator, was renowned for his daring expeditions to the North and South Poles. His courage and determination were legendary but it's his secret diary that has sparked the most intrigue. The mysterious diary was allegedly found by Admiral Byrd's son after his father passed away. According to various accounts, Byrd's journal details an astonishing journey into the Earth's core, where he claimed to have discovered an advanced civilization known as Agartha. The story begins in February 1947, when Byrd was purportedly sent on a mission named Operation High Jump to the South Pole. Operation High Jump, officially titled the United States Navy Antarctic Developments Program, was one of the most ambitious and daring missions of the mid-20th century. Initiated by Admiral Byrd, it was the largest Antarctic expedition ever undertaken, involving 13 ships, 23 aircraft, and more than 4,700 men. The mission was ostensibly scientific and exploratory, aimed at establishing the Antarctic research base Little America IV but the scale of the operation suggested a military component, stirring speculations and conspiracy theories that persist to this day. The expedition set sail from Norfolk, Virginia on December 2, 1946. The fleet, led by the flagship USS Mount Olympus, included a diverse array of vessels from submarines and support ships to seaplane tenders and icebreakers. The aircraft complement was equally impressive, featuring state-of-the-art PBM Mariner seaplanes and R4D Skytrain transport aircraft. The operation, divided into three groups, the Central, Eastern, and Western, was tasked with performing aerial photographic surveys of Antarctica to map the region and identify any potential military threats or strategic advantages. As the expedition unfolded, the team faced numerous challenges. The harsh Antarctic environment, with its extreme cold, unpredictable weather and treacherous ice, proved a formidable adversary. Aircraft were lost and lives were risked, underscoring the perilous nature of the mission. Yet, despite these challenges, the team managed to photograph and map around 1.5 million square kilometers of the Antarctic territory, a monumental achievement that significantly expanded our understanding of the polar region. However, the mission was abruptly terminated in February 1947, a full six months earlier than planned, sparking a flurry of rumors and speculations. The official explanation cited unexpected harsh weather conditions, but some people, fueled by the secrecy surrounding the operation and Admiral Byrd's later alleged secret journal, suggested more mysterious reasons. Officially, the mission's objective was scientific and exploratory, but according to Byrd's secret journal, the truth was far more extraordinary. Bird wrote of flying into the Earth's interior through an opening at the pole, a concept that aligns with the hollow Earth theory. This theory states that the Earth is not a solid sphere but contains substantial interior space. It's a concept that has been part of various cultures and civilizations for centuries. 
In ancient Greece, one of the earliest references to a hollow earth can be found in the myth of Hades, the god of the underworld. This underworld, known as Tartarus, was said to be a deep, gloomy place located beneath the earth, where souls were judged after death. It was a realm of shadows and echoes, a stark contrast to the vibrant life on Earth's surface. In Tibetan Buddhist belief, the concept of a hollow Earth is represented by Shambhala, a mythical kingdom located within the Earth. It is described as a place of peace and wisdom, where enlightened beings reside. Tibetan texts speak of tunnels that connect Shambhala to the surface world, allowing for the exchange of knowledge and wisdom between the two realms. The Hopi Indians of North America also have legends of a hollow earth. They believe their ancestors emerged from a world beneath the earth through a hole in the sky, known as the Sipapu. This subterranean world, they say, was a place of shelter during cataclysms on the surface. In Norse mythology, we find the realm of Svartalfheim, home to the dwarves, deep beneath the earth. These beings were known as master smiths and craftsmen, their underground realm often associated with metalwork and creation. The ancient Egyptians too had their version of the tale. They believed in the existence of the Duat, a vast underworld where the sun god Ra journeyed every night. This underworld was a complex place filled with lakes, rivers, fields, and even cities. Was Admiral Byrd about to discover that all these stories told throughout time were true? Oh, 0600 hours. All preparations are complete for our flight northward and we are airborne with full fuel tanks at 0610 hours. Zero six twenty hours fuel mixture on starboard engine seems too rich. Adjustment made and Pratt Whitney's are running smoothly. 0730 hours. Radio check with base camp. All is well and radio reception is normal. 0740 hours. Note slight oil leak in starboard engine. Oil pre-sure indicator seems normal, however. 0800 hours. Slight turbulence noted from easterly direction. At altitude of 2321 feet. Correction to 1700 feet. No further turbulence. But tailwind increases, slight adjustment in throttle controls, aircraft performing very well now. 0815 hours. Radio check with base camp. Situation normal. 00830 hours. Turbulence encountered again. Increase altitude to 2900 feet, smooth flight conditions again. 0910 hours. Vast ice and snow below, note coloration of yellowish nature and disperse in a linear pattern. Altering course foe, a better examination of this color pattern below. Note reddish or purple color also. Circle this area two full turns and return to assigned compass heading. Position check made again to base camp and relay information concerning colorations in the ice and snow below. 0910 hours. Both magnetic and gyro compasses beginning to gyrate and wobble. We are unable to hold our heading by instrumentation. Take bearing with sun compass, yet all seems well. The controls are seemingly slow to respond and have sluggish quality, but there is no indication of icing. 0915 hours in the distance is what appears to be mountains. 0949 hours. 29 minutes elapsed flight time from the first sighting of the mountains. It is no illusion. They are mountains and consisting of a small range that I have never seen before. 0955 hours. Altitude changed to 2950 feet, encountering strong turbulence again. 1000 hours. We are crossing over the small mountain range and still proceeding northward as best as can be ascertained. Beyond the mountain range is what appears to be a valley with a small river or stream running through the center portion. There should be no green valley below. Something is definitely wrong and abnormal here. We should be over ice and snow. To the port side are great forests growing on the mountain slopes. Our navigation instruments are still spinning. The gyroscope is oscillating back and forth. 1,005 hours. I alter altitude to 1,400 feet and execute a sharp left turn to better examine the valley below. It is green with either moss or a type of tight-knit grass. 
The light here seems different. I cannot see the sun anymore. We make another left turn and we spot what seems to be a large animal of some kind below us. It appears to be an elephant. No, it looks more like a mammoth. This is incredible. Yet there it is. Decrease altitude to a thousand feet and take binoculars to better examine the animal. It is confirmed. It is definitely a mammoth-like animal. Report this to base camp. 10.30 hours. Encountering more rolling green hills now. The external temperature indicator reads 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Continuing on our heading now. Navigation instruments seem normal now. I'm puzzled over their actions. Attempt to contact base camp. Radio is not functioning. 11.30 hours. Countryside below is more level and normal, if I may use that word. Ahead we spot what seems to be a city. This is impossible. Aircraft seems light and oddly buoyant. The controls refuse to respond. My God. Off our port and starboard wings are a strange type of aircraft. They are closing rapidly alongside. They are disc-shaped and have a radiant quality to them. They are close enough now to see the markings on them. It is a type of swastika. Where are we? What has happened? I tug at the controls again. They will not respond. We are caught in an invisible vice grip of some type. 11.35 hours. Our radio crackles and a voice comes through in English with what perhaps is a slight Nordic or Germanic accent. Welcome, Admiral, to our domain. We shall land you in exactly seven minutes. Relax, Admiral. You are in good hands. I note the engines of our plane have stopped running. The aircraft is under some strange control and is now turning itself. The controls are useless. 1140 hours. Another radio message received. We begin the landing process now and in moments the plane shudders slightly and begins a descent as though caught in some great unseen elevator. The downward motion is negligible and we touch down with only a slight jolt. 11.45 hours. I am making a hasty last entry in the flight log. Several men are approaching on foot toward our aircraft. They are tall with blonde hair. In the distance is a large, shimmering city pulsating with rainbow hues of color. I do not know what is going to happen now, but I see no signs of weapons on those approaching. I hear now a voice ordering me by name to open the cargo door. I comply and log. Agartha, according to Bird's diary, was a civilization far more advanced than anything on the Earth's surface. Their technology was superior, and they lived in harmony with nature, harnessing free energy and enjoying long, disease-free lives. The Agarthans, as they were called, were allegedly aware of the surface world's issues, expressing concern about humanity's misuse of technology, particularly nuclear weapons. The narrative becomes even more captivating when Bird wrote about being taken to the city's leader, a wise and gracious man who conveyed a dire warning for surface dwellers. From this point I write all the following events here from memory. It defies the imagination and would seem all but madness if it had not happened. The radio man and I are taken from the aircraft and we are received in a most cordial manner. We were then boarded on a small platform-like conveyance with no wheels. It moves us toward the glowing city with great swiftness. As we approach, the city seems to be made of a crystal material. Soon we arrive at a large building that is a type I have never seen before. It appears to be right out of the design board of Frank Lloyd Wright, or perhaps more correctly, out of a Buck Rogers setting. We are given some type of warm beverage which tasted like nothing I have ever savored before. It is delicious. After about 10 minutes, two of our wondrous appearing hosts come to our quarters and announce that I am to accompany them. I have no choice but to comply. I leave my radio man behind and we walk a short distance and enter into what seems to be an elevator. We descend downward for some moments, the machine stops and the door lifts silently upward. We then proceed down a long hallway that is lit by a rose-colored light that seems to be emanating from the very walls themselves. One of the beings motions for us to stop before a great door. Over the door is an inscription that I cannot read. 
The great door slides noiselessly open, and I am beckoned to enter. One of my hosts speaks. Have no fear, Admiral. You are to have an audience with the Master. I step inside, and my eyes adjust to the beautiful coloration that seems to be filling the room completely. Then I begin to see my surroundings. What greeted my eyes is the most beautiful sight of my entire existence. It is in fact too beautiful and wondrous to describe. It is exquisite and delicate. I do not think there exists a human term that can describe it in any detail with justice. My thoughts are interrupted in a cordial manner by a warm, rich voice of melodious quality. I bid you welcome to our domain, Admiral. I see a man with delicate features and with the etching of years upon his face. He is seated at a long table. He motions me to sit down in one of the chairs. After I am seated, he places his fingertips together and smiles. He speaks softly again and conveys the following. We have let you enter here because you are of noble character and well known on the surface world, Admiral. Surface world, I half gasp under my breath. Yes, you are in the domain of the Ariani, the inner world of the earth. We shall not long delay your mission and you will be safely escorted back to the surface and for a distance beyond. But now, Admiral, I shall tell you why you have been summoned here. Our interest rightly begins just after your race exploded the first atomic bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. It was at that alarming time we sent our flying machines, the Flugelrads, to your surface world to investigate what your race had done. That is, of course, past history now, my dear Admiral, but I must continue on. You see, we have never interfered before in your race's wars and barbarity, but now we must, for you, have learned to temper with a certain power that is not for men, namely that of atomic energy. Our emissaries have already delivered messages to the powers of your world, and yet they do not heed. Now you have been chosen to be witness here that our world does exist. You see, our culture and science is many thousands of years beyond your race, Admiral. I interrupted, but what does this have to do with me, sir? The master's eyes seem to penetrate deeply into my mind, and after studying me for a few moments, he replied, Your race has now reached the point of no return, for there are those among you who would destroy your very world rather than relinquish their power as they know it. I nodded and the master continued. In 1945 and afterward, we tried to contact your race, but our efforts were met with hostility. Our flugelrads were fired upon. Yes, even pursued with malice and animosity by your fighter planes. So now, I say to you, my son, there is a great storm gathering in your world. A black fury that will not spend itself for many years. There will be no answer in your arms. There will be no safety in your signs. It may rage on until every flower of your culture is trampled and all human things are leveled in vast chaos. Your recent war was only a prelude of what is yet to come for your race. We here see it more clearly with each hour. Do you say I am mistaken? No, I answer. It happened once before. The Dark Ages came and they lasted for more than 500 years. Yes, my son, the master replied. The Dark Ages that will come now for your race will cover the earth like a pall. But I believe that some of your race will live through the storm. Beyond that, I cannot say. We see at a great distance a new world stirring from the ruins of your race, seeking its lost and legendary treasures, and they will be here, my son, safe in our keeping. When that time arrives, we shall come forward again to help revive your culture and your race. Perhaps by then you will have learned the futility of war and its strife. And after that time, certain of your culture and science will be returned for your race to begin anew. You, my son, are to return to the surface world with this message. With these closing words, our meeting seemed at an end. I stood for a moment as in a dream, but yet I knew this was reality. And for some strange reason, I bowed slightly, either out of respect or humility. I do not know which. 
Suddenly I was again aware that the two beautiful hosts who had brought me here were again at my side. This way, Admiral, motioned one. I turned once more before leaving and looked back toward the master. A gentle smile was etched on his delicate and ancient face. Farewell, my son. He spoke, then he gestured with a lovely slender hand a motion of peace, and our meeting was truly ended. Quickly we walked back through the great door of the master's chamber and once again entered into the elevator. The door slid silently downward and we were at once going upward. One of my hosts spoke again. We must now make haste, Admiral, as the master desires to delay you no longer on your scheduled timetable and you must return with his message to your race. I said nothing. All of this was almost beyond belief and once again my thoughts were interrupted as we stopped. I entered the room and was again with my radio man. He had an anxious expression on his face. As I approached, I said, It is all right, Howie, it is all right. The two beings motioned us toward the awaiting conveyance we boarded and soon arrived back at the aircraft. The engines were idling and we boarded immediately. The whole atmosphere seemed charged now with a certain air of urgency. After the cargo door was closed, the aircraft was immediately lifted by that unseen force until we reached an altitude of 2,700 feet. Two of the aircraft were alongside for some distance guiding us on our return way. I must state here the airspeed indicator registered no reading, yet we were moving along at a very rapid rate. Two and fifteen hours. A radio message comes through. We are leaving you now, Admiral. Your controls are free. Auf Wiedersehen. We watched for a moment as the Flugelrads disappeared into the pale blue sky. The aircraft suddenly felt as though caught in a sharp downdraft for a moment. We quickly recovered her control. We do not speak for some time. Each man has his thought. Upon his return, Bird claimed he was debriefed by top U.S. officials and sworn to secrecy about his discoveries. The government, he alleged, suppressed the truth about Agartha and the Hollow Earth, deeming it too shocking and disruptive for the public. March 11, 1947, I have just attended a staff meeting at the Pentagon. I have stated fully my discovery and the message from the Master. All is duly recorded. The President has been advised. I am now detained for several hours. Six hours, 39 minutes to be exact. I am interviewed intently by top security forces and a medical team. It was an ordeal. I am placed under strict control via the national security provisions of this United States of America. I am ordered to remain silent in regard to all that I have learned on the behalf of humanity. Incredible. I am reminded that I am a military man and I must obey orders. Admiral Byrd's secret journal and the tale of Agartha is a narrative that continues to captivate. But is any of it real? Well, the alleged secret journal and stories it contain are both works of fiction. Admiral Byrd's son never found a secret diary because the Admiral never kept one. The secret journal has been published by multiple authors over the years, with some passing it off as the real deal. Still skeptics believe the secret journal to be legitimate and related to Antarctica being off-limits. The story of the crystal city of Agartha and its Nordic inhabitants is a legend that will not soon be forgotten. It blurs the line between reality and fantasy challenging our understanding of the world and our place within it. Whether you believe it's a factual account or an elaborate tale, it serves as a stark reminder of the importance of harmony with nature and the potential consequences of our actions. The story invites us to question, to explore, and to imagine, just as Admiral Byrd did throughout his life. It encourages us to look beyond the known and venture into the unknown, for it is there that the greatest discoveries are often made. After all, isn't that the essence of exploration? Thank you so much for watching. What did you think of the story of Admiral Byrd's secret journey? Drop a comment below, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more mysteries of our world.